Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started. I know um, sometimes we'll have more people joining as we go forward, but let me turn on my video as well. So I want to just briefly welcome everybody to our next session in the One Health Workforce Next Generation um, COVID-19 One Health Update Series. Um, I'm going to hand over to Yuta from our ECHO Institute to go over the initial introduction housekeeping, and then we'll go ahead and and hear briefly from uh, VPAT and myself and kick off our session for today. So thank you for everyone for being here. And Yuta, why don't you go ahead and, and go through those upfront things that would be helpful. Thank you, Wotrina. Welcome everyone from the ECHO Institute. Um, so we have a packed agenda again today. Um, let me walk you through some housekeeping items. So we would encourage you to turn your camera on so we can maybe get some face-to-face -face time and uh, get to know some of you. Um, while you're not speaking, please keep your microphone muted so we don't have additional noise. Um, if you can, rename yourself so we know who you are and what your affiliation is. For any IT problems, you can chat Echo IT to troubleshoot Zoom. Um, the chat function we want to reserve for the questions. It's not necessary that you put in your attendance into the chat, so please just questions in the chat. If you have downloaded the PDA app, you had a link in the invitation how to do that. You can now use um, your phone and the app to scan this QR code, which will give you an attestation and access to the presentations of today's session. Uh, the presentation slides will also be shared in an email um, along with the recording of the session. The session is being recorded um, and your attendance is consent to be recorded, so thank you for that. There will be continuing professional development credits available through the University of New Mexico and towards the end of the session we will sh share a link to the short survey that provides you the credits in the uh, chat. And if you are someone who uh, posts on social media, there's a link to a social media guide that we'll also post in the chat. And uh, that is that. And I'll hand back to Audrina and uh, uh, the CMO team. Great, thanks Yuta. So um, let me just very briefly um, open the session today. We have a number of different ideas that we're gonna be working with together. You all are going to be solving a One Health problem real time. And so, um, so we'll go ahead and work through that together. Um, and I think that will be a slightly different format than what we've done before, but it's typically a fun way to think about ideas and solutions and critical thinking. Um, but first I would love to turn over to Pat as our lead from Siahoon and have him share his introductory comments. So just a uh, warm level come, a uh, good day for, for everyone. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm with Pat Kujitam, uh, executive director from the Southeast Asia One Health University Network. So we have been uh, starting uh, with the COVID uh, One Health update uh, since uh, late March. So uh, we've now uh, been uh, together for about uh, seven months. So uh, thanks for uh, tuning uh, back. So or welcome for anyone who's joining for the first time. So this is gonna be the last uh, session for the series. And you know we be excited that uh, and thankful uh, for the uh, being a co-host and 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 all the work uh, with the One Health Workforce Next Generation team uh, for that and uh, for the creativity uh, for this session you're gonna see uh, the new format today uh, more engaging uh, for everyone uh, in terms of the One Health approach uh, to investigating uh, the spillover. So with that, uh, with the limited of time that we have, uh, this is uh, only a short 90 minute sessions and intend to be more very interactive. So uh, please, uh, 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 I mean that, uh, uh, feel free uh, to share your thoughts and comments either to the chat box or just uh, raise your hand. So with that, uh, we also always uh, start with the session. So Brian Berg, uh, who's the Associate Director for the One Hill Institute from the uh, University of California at Davis. Uh, he's been doing uh, such a fabulous job in, you know, keeping us uh, updated uh, on the news around the world. I always learn something new uh, of the update uh, every day. So he's basically uh, have a huge task of uh, having a next snapshot of what's actually uh, happening around the world. So uh, Dr. Brian Burke will kick us off uh, with that, Brian. All right. Thank you, Dr. Vipat and Dr. Smith. And it's Let's see everyone again. I can see some of your faces in the little squares on my Zoom window. 
And uh, yes, as, as Dr. Bipad said, this is our seventh session together. Can you believe it? We've been together since the end of March, uh, about every two weeks, talking about important developments in the COVID-19 uh, landscape, uh, things we could do to help uh, ourselves understand the outbreak, but also combat this global pandemic. With that, I'm going to start my screen share. Hang on just a moment. Share. All right. I believe now we're ready. Yeah. So tonight's topic is about, or this morning's topic for you, is about One Health approaches to investigating spillovers and outbreaks. And you know, COVID-19 is a fantastic example of the impacts that zoonotic diseases can have around the world very rapidly, right? We've been battling this virus uh, since at least January, uh, tremendous global impacts, tremendous health impacts, economic impacts, and it's really revealed uh, weaknesses in our global structures, but also our strengths as people working together, as our public health practitioners, our One Health colleagues, our medical care uh, colleagues, working around the world really trying to solve this problem. And I just want to remember, remind everyone, this is the One Health uh, workforce next generation. We are here to think about diseases and disease entities in a One Health approach. And I just have an example here of, this is a, a, a filovirus or a bolovirus, a spillover uh, a schematic. You know, we think about these viruses having reservoirs in nature, there may be spillover or transmission to other animals, and then eventually this gets into the human population. And what we're concerned about is the initial spillover, but then also in the outbreaks, once human-to-human -human transmission is going on, what can we do? And we've had sessions on diagnostic testing, how will we identify people that have been infected, but also vaccines and other countermeasures. If you remember last time, we had wonderful talks from CEPI and other individuals that were working in this space to try to develop vaccines to help protect us. And let's, not, let's also remember, though, that it's not always bats or monkeys and people. There are a lot of animals that could be involved in zoonotic disease spillover, like camels, mosquitoes. There's lots of diseases there, lots of viruses, lots of other pathogens that can spill over. So don't always focus just on the bats, but remember we all live in a huge collective environment and ecosystem. So as our global update, uh, the situation, much as it has been uh, for the last several weeks, it has really been uh, a, a, an almost ever increasing a number of cases around the world. Uh, since we last spoke last time, there are about 1.7 million more confirmed cases of COVID-19 around the world. Now virtually every country in the, on the globe has uh, confirmed cases with about 8 million cases. When you look at our Seahun countries, uh, you continue to do a very nice job in general of controlling the outbreak, but the, the, the trend is upwards in several of the countries. Uh, since we last spoke, uh, there's about 20,000 more cases across our network of colleagues and countries, and that's about a 27% increase over the last two weeks. But there is really good news. A really nice development came yesterday in the news uh, that a, a large trial being conducted by the University of Oxford has found that dexamethasone, a very commonly available uh, uh, steroid, uh, that could help uh, reduce the inflammation that might be associated with COVID-19, does seem to affect to be protective in severely affected patients. And I have more information on that in my next slide. So this trial is called Recovery, and I recommend everyone click the little link there in the bottom of my slide, and that'll take you to the press release, but more importantly, the larger website that talks about this randomized clinical trial for interventions, medical interventions for COVID-19 disease. And they're trying several different uh, uh, therapies, uh, different antiviral drugs, some antibiotics and a convalescent plasma and dexamethasone, which is a type of steroid. <coughs> and this is a large trial, as I mentioned, based out of the University of Oxford in England. They've enrolled now about 11,500 patients and they're randomized to these treatments to look in a very scientifically rigorous way, which ones of these may be beneficial in treatment and which ones may do more harm. Uh, so about 2,000 patients were randomized to dexamethasone, and the key finding that they reported was that there was a reduction in mortality by one-third in the most severely affected patients. So these are the people that are requiring ventilation because they're having acute respiratory collapse. Uh, the recovery trials also shown that some drugs that we thought might have effect do not. 
uh, they did a large trial as well of hydro hydroxychloroquine and showed that that drug is not effective. And based on that trial data, the US FDA recently dropped their emergency use authorization for that drug for use as a COVID-19 therapeutic. So I recommend you, you check this link here uh, and find out more about both the recovery trial and the efforts at University of Oxford. They also have a large vaccine trial as well. And uh, learn more, more as you can. So as the last slide that for this introductory part, as it is every time, is, is a list of links that can take you to factual information that's important to know about in this uh, global pandemic. All right, so now, typically, we would have transitioned to a, a series of speakers, but tonight we're gonna try something different, something new, something exciting, I hope, something I think you will find uh, interesting and exciting. Uh, and that is, we're going to work as a community of practice. And to do that, we need you the folks listening in, every all the little talking heads I see here in my screen, please. Today we're going to work on an outbreak scenario with import inputs from a various uh, distinguished panel of speakers that we have. And we have a, a great, fantastic uh, series of speakers. Uh, we have Dean Belisario, from the, he's the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Philippines. We have Kevin Olival from EcoHealth Alliance. And we have others that will pop, pop in from different times. So. We're gonna talk about an outbreak scenario and it, please join in the conversation. If, either, if I see your name and can call on you directly, I may, but if you feel like you really have something important you want to contribute to the conversation, please raise your hand or put it in the chat box that you have something you want to contribute and we'll try to call on you as time allows. And let's learn from each other. Let's have fun, let's explore this outbreak scenario because it's really relevant to our current situation and really to the prime message that we can only overcome these pandemic threats if we work together. Okay, so with that, here's the scenario, right? So physicians at a regional hospital in your country have noticed 15 patients with similar clinical signs present over the past five days. So 15 patients with the same type of illness presented in a short time frame. Each patient presented with a fever, cough, difficulty breathing, and a rash. Over the next three days, Several patients progress to acute respiratory distress over a short period, three-day period, right? Five of the patients died. So five of 15 died, and that's a 33% case fatality ratio. Now, 11 of these 15 were reported to have gone to a cultural event in a nearby national park or forest near their communities, okay? So your role, everyone listening in, everyone that I can see in my little squares, your role is is that you are now a professor at the super good university. I mean, not just sort of okay good, but I mean super good university, right? The best of the best. And the physicians have come to you because you're a super good professor of One Health at the best of the best university, and they want to ask you, what should we do next? Okay, so we're gonna have a poll, and I want everyone to vote. Uh, you get to click one option, and it's what should we do next, okay? Just pick one option, and. We're going to go with that, is whatever is the most common option. We'll start our discussion there after some introductory comments from Dean Belazari. And one quick note, anyone who's a co-host or an instructor in this should not complete the poll or end the poll. Just don't touch the poll. Yeah, don't touch the poll. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, bad things happen. But everyone else, please vote on what you think you should do next. There are no wrong answers. There's no wrong answers here. Just uh, what's your impression of what we should do, given the scenario that you see there on the screen? And we'll let that run a few minutes. Uh, so once we get this, we'll tally, tally this up and then we'll pivot to Dean Belisario and he's gonna give us a brief update on the situation in the Philippines on COVID-19 in particular. And then we're gonna loop back to this uh, and we'll start with whatever was the most uh, common uh, first choice. Oh, we got a tie, I didn't anticipate that, yikes. Okay, uh, oh good, the tie's broken. Okay, good, yeah, so just give it another few minutes. Everybody click an option. Um, all right, so Yuta, can you continue to see the poll even if I in my share screen and everything? Is that correct? Uh, yes, I see the poll, uh, but okay. the participants are not seeing the answers yet. Okay, great. Okay, so let's, while they're still voting, there's a few people are still voting, I see the numbers coming up. Let's, uh, I'll stop my share. So everyone knows the scenario. Some patients came from regional hospital. Some were severely affected. Some were fatal cases. 
several of them went to a national park or forest for a cultural event. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share now. And let's have Dean Belisario share his, his updates from the Philippines. And then once we collect all the answers, we'll pivot back to our scenario, okay? So Dean Belisario, I'll hand the mic over to you and uh, please uh, share with us your thoughts on COVID-19 in the Philippines. Thank you very much, Dr. Bird. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Hear you loud and clear. Can you, can you see the slide I'm showing? Uh, yes, sir. We definitely can. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for this opportunity to interact with our One Health uh, colleagues from different parts of the world. Very pleased to be uh, representing Philippines in this forum, part of Shahun. A few, just a few minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, currently professor and dean of the School of Public Health, University of the Philippines, Manila, which is also designated as the Regional Center for Public Health of the Simeo Tropmed. Uh, network uh, which exists in this part of the world. I wish to uh, uh, provide uh, just a short, short update on the uh, uh, COVID uh, situation in the Philippines. This slide actually tells us um, a couple of things. Uh, of course, uh, we do have in our dashboard as of uh, a couple of days ago, more than 20,000 uh, cases. We do have um, uh, a mix of New cases, what government in the Philippines calls quote unquote fresh. Now, fresh in the sense that the results are just recently out, as in, in the last couple of days. In most instances, there, is, there, are, there, are, there are much delays in terms of testing and getting the results now on board the database now before it gets transmitted to the authorities for sharing to the public for response and action. And so, a, a major lesson really is the delay now in testing and the delay in transmission of the results, and thus it results in delay in response and action. Um, we started out with this pandemic with just one teeny weeny testing center in the heart of Manila. Now we're up to 57, aiming to, to reach a, a goal of 30,000 tests per day. We're not there yet. Now we targeted that in the last month. We're still aiming to get 30,000. A, small, a smaller country like Malaysia is doing, I heard, 35,000 tests per day and still will not, not quite there uh, uh, um, A major challenge of a lack of unit. And thus, contact do not coverage reaching out into the dashboard of the uh, Dean Belazar. just want to. We're, we're having a lot of trouble hearing you. Yeah. Um, you're breaking up, the audio is breaking up quite a lot. Uh, we heard a lot of your presentation, but the last few minutes have been uh, tough to hear. Okay, so I will, uh, okay. Um, I'm wrapping up and delays in our response and now uh, but but really coordinate effort which is espoused but as this field that we have looking for for us thank you very much thank you dean belisario we caught <clears throat> several of your points i believe it, it seemed that the main point you stressed several times was that the uh, being quick and rapid in the response is very important. Uh, any delays that happen for whatever reason can really lead to uh, big increases in cases. Uh, would you say that was a, a prime take-home message from your uh, from your talk? You also you, you actually got it right, Dr. Bird. No? And, and, and thus uh, the lack of adequate data no, and the timeliness 
and the lack of timeliness of the data now delaying response mm. and, and, and and as such we have continuing continue community transmission up, mm. up to now mm. yeah th thank you for that i that is a definitely a key take home uh, of this pandemic and many other outbreaks uh, that several of us uh, here in, in in our community of practice have worked on that uh, a moment's delay, and it doesn't matter what the cause is, uh, it's just the delays themselves add up so much uh, to both the uh, increasing incidence, but also the amount of energy it takes to help push back against the outbreak once it starts going in bigger and bigger transmission cycles. So uh, thank you for that. Appreciate that. All right, so uh, I guess Dean Belisario, you could uh, stop your screen share now and uh, we'll return back to our poll results. Uh, so uh, Yuta, can you show us uh, what our, uh, our uh, community of practice thought was the best, best things to do first? Okay, great. All right, so uh, secret to the multiple choice quiz is that there was no absolute right answer. Uh, all the answers are certainly things we should do. But it looks like the uh, majority, well, not the majority, but I guess the preponderance of people uh, thought we should send out a contact tracing team and implement community surveillance uh, as a first step, okay? Uh, so, Dean Belisario, would you mind sharing some thoughts uh, on how, is, as you just mentioned, delays in maybe getting contact tracing teams out are important in the uh, outbreak response and your thoughts on community surveillance? Yes, it's very important, I feel, that uh, uh, we get the authorities on board. Um, uh, note that in the real scheme of things, um, while universities you know, have a role to play in terms of providing technical support you know, for our authorities' uh, plan of work, um, in this case, um, it, it, it seems like we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And thus, um, one of the first things I wish to do is to bring in uh, a level of authority that is tasked to oversee this type of operation. But of course, uh, ours should be a stance of uh, a, a collaborative approach. No? Uh, and, and this has been seen a number of times. No? Our university itself has done this a couple of times in the area of investigation of emerging parasitic zoonosis no, in the Philippines. No? And, and, and there have been some um, uh, uh, favorable outcomes no, with that type of collaboration. No? Um, yes, um, there's, there has to be action that has to be done. And, and, and of course, the collaborative way of uh, contact tracing in collaboration with our authorities no, and, and the collection of the day be most ideal in this case. Uh, yes, thank, thank you for that. So, so here's the exciting part we're going to try. Okay, so is there someone uh, in the audience that would like to speak to, uh, we'll, we'll pick, uh, let's pick back to the contact tracing, finding out the case investigation aspects of an outbreak. Has anyone here been involved in the make would like to share their experience or lessons learned? Uh, it, please uh, just uh, let us know. I'm not sure if we can see who can raise their hand or not. Um, yeah, so there's a couple ways to do that. Um, so just as a best practice for these sorts of interactive discussions, if you have the participant tool open and can see the list of everyone who signed in, then you can also at the bottom of that choose the raise your hand icon and a little hand will come up next to your name on the participant list. So that's a good way to indicate that you'd like to share your ideas on your experiences or what to do next. You can also use the chat box um, and many people are very comfortable just typing in the chat box their ideas. Um, but I know there are a number of folks just from scanning through the list of participants here who do have experience with um, implementing community surveillance in different ways. So it would be great to hear from one or two folks on any best practices or how it's really worked and what some of the challenges can be in doing it, um, because I know that there's a lot of ideas in the mix here. Um, so if anyone would like to start us out, we can take a few minutes to explore that and then also talk about the other options that were in the poll, because those are also good things to be doing.
No one? Anyone? Uh, well, I can share an experience from myself if, if no one else would like to speak. Um, anyone? Remember, we're trying a community of practice. We're trying to share our thoughts across the world. There are people from all over the world dialed in, uh, wanting to listen and hear our lessons learned and our experiences and our collective practices. Oh, I see uh, Melania. Melania has her hand up. Uh, please, if you'd like to share. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually want to share something that I experienced before, not in a COVID out outbreak, but in a food poisoning outbreak. I was in skating there in Indonesia, in Malang, Surabaya, uh, East Java. And the first thing we need to do is to contact the provincial health office because without that, uh, we cannot go to the field and then when we go to the field we also need to contact the authority there because when i and even with that some people the villagers didn't uh didn't want to share uh, uh to give their consent because they are somehow scared to to tell uh to tell us uh they they didn't believe sometimes that that we have go there to investigate with the uh, health workers from the health center, public health center in the village. Because people didn't believe us with, without them. So people, uh, there is a delay in the investigation because of that. So I, uh, from my experience, it's really important to engage with the authorities, uh, authorities there. So that's my experience. Thank you. I'm sorry I cannot open my ear because of bed size now, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no worries. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> you bring up a really important piece in the, any kind of disease investigation is that you have to have the buy-in from the community, right? Um, and uh, maybe we'll back to Dean Belisario. Maybe you can uh, discuss a little bit about how in your, your institution, University of the Philippines, the School of Public Health, how you help instill those lessons into your students so that they're aware that, you know, by contact authorities, as you had mentioned, coming in with the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Agriculture, depending on the disease, an important thing to build community trust. Dean? Thanks, Dr. Bird. Um, uh, I would turn, uh, I would keep my uh, video off, I think, to, to keep the, the, the signals uh, strong enough for transmission. I hope you don't mind. Okay, in, in our school, you know, uh, more than the principles that we teach in the classroom, and, and now we're, we're going to, no choice, getting into more online mode of teaching in, in the flexible mode you know, with, with, with COVID-19 and the new normal. There has to be some practical experience, uh, Dr. Bird you know, and, and colleagues, um, to actually show the students the way you know, to, do, to do this. You know. Uh, going back to the scenario that, that you painted, for instance, it would be best you know, students will have a, a first-hand experience um, looking into and investigating a small outbreak like this. You know, but might seem small, might actually be uh, bigger than that. You know? uh, the, the showing the process of, of tying up with the local authorities, you know, as, as mentioned by a colleague earlier, the provincial health office, and later on the national authority that, that, that should be on top of this situation, uh, demonstrating to the students the role of experts you know, in the university, that they're not really frontliners, but they're in support of the national and, and the provincial authorities you know, in the conduct of the investigation, all in our efforts to collate, collect and collate data, the evidence you know, that, that, must be, that, that, that must become the basis for response and action. You know? The data here will be the evidence-based part that actually directs action, whether it is policy or actual guidelines or actual orders. You know? Note that uh, we'd like to also demonstrate to our students, uh, experts working with each other, an interdisciplinary type of, of, of engagement. You know? where the medical doctor is, is not king of all, where medical doctors will work with, for instance, if this seems to be a zoonotic infection, we have to work with the, the vets, you know? because the vets spearhead 
animal, animal health and animal public health. Uh, the medical doctor does not know all. Probably we will need to, to get in touch with our epidemiology, our biostatistician, our environmental health expert, and such is what our College of Public Health uh, wishes to demonstrate, an interdisciplinary type of undertaking in public health, and in this case, One Health. Note that I have, I have um, a set of ac an, an acronym called uh, 3, 4, or five, where we disease actually correspond to showing the students a collaborative way of doing things, interdisciplinary, not, not one do all. Number two, we have to coordinate with each other. The different disciplines doing their own thing and, and, and at the end of the day, we get back to each other and, and, and collate and complement each other. We have a consensus. We have sets of data that we need to come up a consensus on because the consensus will, will actually give us one voice when we speak to the authorities. This is the complete, this is more or less the landscape that we're working on. We need to communicate this with policymakers and also the public you know, by way of health promotion and education. So collaborate, coordinate, consensus, and communicate. That's it, That's it yeah, Dr. No, Bird. Thank, thank you, Dean. That was, that was really great. I like that four C's of of how to work together. And again, because you're absolutely right. None of us have all the answers. Uh, our, our heads are only so big, so that means our brains are only so big. So we can't be experts in everything, right? So that, that's fantastic. Well, looking at down through the poll, uh, let's switch gears a little bit and look at some of the other options and let's discuss perhaps from people's uh, experiences, things that they've done. So th the next most popular choice uh, down the list is, is in this vein as well of contacting the Ministry of Health and reporting uh, the, the initial disease cluster. And as anybody would like to share experiences there in their work where they've done that, it doesn't have to be the Ministry of Health, could be the Ministry of Agriculture if it was a purely uh, animal-based disease, uh, and how that process goes and what might people should think about when they want to report to a ministry to say, Something, something bad is happening. Some disease is happening in this area. Well, anyone that would like to share an experience uh, on that? Anyone at all? Just raise your hand and I'll keep scanning. Um, could have been for me, for any disease. Uh, doesn't have to be COVID. That's, that's not, not important in this discussion. Oh, I see. Dr. Bird, you're muted. Oh, I am uh, muted. There you are. How, about, how long have I been muted? The just whole time? Oh, okay. Just the last, just the last bit. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, I see uh, Kasara Sastrin, and I can't see the end of your name, has her hand up. Would you like to share your perspectives? Yes, I would like to share my experience. Yeah, please. Uh, please. This is about uh, Antrax. It, 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 it was in uh, Yogyakarta, one part, one city of Indonesia and um, we uh, conduct a uh, One Health uh, web, uh, seminar, and it includes One Health collaboration with Ministry of Health and also Ministry of Animal Health. And it really um, gives uh, a better uh, perspective of different um, health and animal health uh, collaboration. And uh, it, it's also how the community uh, understands about uh, this is uh, the case of a cow that's uh, infected by anthrax and many uh, humans in the population in uh, Gunung Kidul uh, district has um, even one or two people uh, die of anthrax. And they uh, start to understand that anthrax uh, if, is a disease that's quite uh, challenging and it, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, a, a mortal disease. It's, it, people, uh, people can die of it. And uh, because um, the people usually, uh, the community of people usually uh, just eat, even though they know it's a, a sick uh, cow. And then when the um, animal uh, try to, uh, talk to them and understand it's a sick animal, it's not allowed to eat. And then they uh, really 
can better understanding of what anthrax is and the anthrax is a decreasing uh, nowadays. Thank you. Oh yeah, uh, thank, thank you for that perspective. Yeah, anthrax is certainly a, a, a global disease of super high importance and consequence if people do get infected. Uh, it's certainly one that crosses both sectors, the animal health sector, human health sector, and it's a classic example of, uh, of a bacterial zoonosis. So thank you for sharing that perspective. Would anyone else like to talk about their experiences in trying to draw in ministries to be supportive of efforts, disease investigation efforts? Um, If not, then uh, Brian, I'll just I'll just oh, yeah, add please. in something. Yeah, you know, this please. is not a personal experience, but uh, COVID nineteen. Just thinking about the way that that outbreak on the early days in Wuhan, China, and partially just reconstructed from what I read in the news. You know, not my own uh, connections or, um, but you know, there was a. One of the criticisms of the delay in the response initially was that some of the doctors were a little bit nervous to report it to a central health level um, because they didn't want to show that, you know, at, at their regional or provincial level that maybe they didn't have a good handle on things. Um, so I think, you know, to that poll question about reporting to Ministry of Health, I think we need to think about administrative level as well, right? And if you have a very receptive sort of provincial or, re or regional level Ministry of Health um, office that's, that's more receptive to sort of responding and to you know, being less critical um, instead of going all the way up to the top, um, important consideration as well to sort of uh, increasing the timeline on that as Dr. Belisario was saying, you, know, you don't want delays. So that was just one little thing that may have delayed things a bit, at least from some of the news reports over. Oh, yeah, thanks, Dr. Alder. That's a very important point as well to talk about. At what point do you enter into the ministries for those kind of discussions and to get traction? Uh, and I, I can understand how it can be quite daunting to, to try to report what is essentially bad news into the health nations uh, and the authorities of a country, uh, having done that a few times myself and others here. In, in, in my experiences, uh, uh, as everyone here knows, my work is primarily in Africa, dealing with uh, uh, diseases like Ebola's and those, and uh, we're trying to communicate that finding in a sensitive way uh, to work collaboratively, as Dean Belisario mentioned in his four C's, to be able to pull on the rope of protecting public health in the same direction. That is a critical thing, and it's a great uh, skill to learn and to also learn from others, your peers, for those of you that are younger students, to talk with the older uh, students and the faculty here about how they've managed that in their careers. It's an important thing. And, and that kind of leads us into one of the other options that was here that was talking about alerting the public. Uh, how do you do that in a sensitive way uh, in it, to both inform the public about what's going on, but also not to cause total panic uh, across the country if there was a, certainly a bad disease. Uh, to present itself. And uh, Dean Belisario, maybe I'll come back to you to give some opening thoughts on how you feel or how you think and uh, implement uh, risk communications, uh, health uh, promotion information, and uh, disease outbreak information dissemination uh, uh, in your... Please. Thanks. And uh, one of the major strategies in all public health programs is what we call health promotion and education. Um, I, I, I call it a staple. A sta a staple no? if, if, if you are from Southeast Asia, your, your staple food is rice. There's always rice no, when, you eat, when you eat. Probably in US or, or Europe, there's, there's probably rice or bread or, or some noodles. No? Health promotion in public health. No? Without health promotion, it's not a complete meal. Thus, we emphasize the importance of health promotion where we do not incite panic. It is evidence-based. No? It's coming from data that is derived in an acceptable manner. Um, acceptable manner. Um, 
there's a song in the US, I forgot the artist, Dr. Bird, no? break it to me gently. No? You, you have to break the news gently without sowing panic, without sowing so much fear. Although in public health, just a bit of actor will be okay, but not too much of it. No? Or else people scram and actually, and that was what happened in the Philippines, if I may share. Um, two days before the lockdown of the National Capital Region, uh, and that is where Metro Manila is, the government announced that we will lock down Metro Manila in 48 hours. People scrammed out of Metro Manila, and you know what happened? They spread COVID to the province. And, 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 and again, you know, it, it speaks of the role of the experts. While gover government has a role, the experts have a role to play also in helping provide guidance you know, to our authorities on how to do it, how to break it to the public gently. News to the authorities that there seems to be a brewing outbreak there. No, the, 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 the ever told in this in, in this forum no, about the 11 out of the 15 and the five out of 15 dying. You also have to break it to the authorities gently no, because you don't you don't want to so panic also on the part of the authorities. No, and and of course their assurance that that government or authorities will will take will take care of you is very important. No, rather than you, you, you're on your own, you have this problem and you're on your own. No, so, so such is health promotion, risk communication. We also use the term now strategic communication. No? How, how are you going to communicate it? No? And it has to be well planned, well executed. I think I'll end there, Dr. Bird. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I agree. The health promotion is a staple that's bread and butter of everything that we do, I think, in public health and in One Health is communicating those results out. And I liked your analogy with fear. And I would say that the fear factor is a bit like salt in your communications. Mm -hmm. Just the right amount of salt or fear mm -hmm. will make the staple meal be able to be digested I well. Like that. If you I get like too much salt in there, it's, it's, it's spoiled. Yeah. And uh, people will run away. That is absolutely the case I've seen in, in my work across uh, parts, parts of the continent of Africa. Um, well, I'm going to, uh, uh, as you know, the, the world of outbreaks is, a, is a, always a dynamic and an interesting and you never know which way is up situation. And I'm going to have a colleague of mine, Dr. Tracy Goldstein from the U University of California, uh, share a late breaker from the laboratory on our outbreak. So, Dr. Goldstein. Thanks. Dr. Bird. Um, great to see everybody here tonight. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things I do in my lab is help to investigate unusual mortality events, um, sometimes in marine mammals, and then as a part of our previous work in, in the PREDICT project, um, in uh, looking at people and, and uh, rural wildlife as well. And, you know, sort of the first thing to think about is what are the clinical signs that we're seeing and then coming up with our list of differentials. And so in this scenario, Dr. Bird, you talked a lot about respiratory infections. Um, so those top things on my list that I would think about, of course, would be things like influenza, coronaviruses, and paramyxoviruses. Um, but of course, we don't know which ones those are. And my go-to, um, even before sort of the last 10 years of doing this, has always been from a world where we don't have reagents and we don't know what viruses um, the animal theory. And so I sort of have always gone a little bit old school in that I do sort of sort of consensus PCR or sort of family PCR, where it's not the most sensitive thing, but it allows you to detect something new um, in a relatively um, inexpensive way. And the nice thing about that is this, uh, these assays are useful across species and also across sample types. So it's a really good first way um, to get a little bit of information um, about you know, what might be going on. And um, so that's often the way that I would start. Um, I know these days, another a, a thing that's often a go-to and, and I think is often very useful if you have the facility set up is something like next generation sequencing, of course. Maybe you'll get an answer um, much quicker um, with that because you could potentially amplify um, you know, the complete viral genome and of course you get a lot more information um, when, you, when you use that. So um, even with that, I, I think my go-to is some sort of less expensive but quicker result type screening where you get a little bit of information and then move on. And then in fact, I have some examples. I don't know if our, any of our colleagues are on the call tonight, but early on in the SARS um, coronavirus outbreak that we're currently in, 
some of our lab teams were actually able to use this exact strategy to detect um, COVID-19 in people before the viral sequence was available and also before specifics are available. So I think having these additional tools in the toolkit is really helpful because it allows you to either detect something new or detect a virus when it changes. And that's a really nice thing to have in your back pocket when your you know, specific assays aren't working. Um, so maybe I'll just stop there and see if there's anything else that you were hoping I might touch on. Uh, no, thanks, Dr. Goldstein. That, that's great. I, I think it's important uh, when we think about outbreaks and disease clusters, we, we don't know what the answer is, the, the, the etiology, the cause. We don't know that when the outbreak starts. And having a broad uh, approach is really important. Because uh, oftentimes uh, new diseases will emerge, just like SARS-2 did just very recently, and others uh, that the assays of the day will not detect. And I think that's a key lesson uh, brought out just by you just now and in our previous diagnostic session. You know, uh, having a broad mind and having trained laboratory scientists are a key part of the One Health workforce. Uh, without them, uh, we can't complete the cycle of the outbreak investigation and actually nail down the cause. Um, so, so would anything from our audience, uh, either on uh, these uh, health from our social outreach aspects or on the laboratory uh, side of things, uh, I welcome you to, uh, to share your thoughts. Uh, I would anyone you raise your hand in the chat or just chat it in the uh, chat box and I'll, I'll, I'll see you and come back to you. No. no one. Okay. Uh, it's a quiet group there. It must be early in the morning. Uh, either uh, everyone has had uh, too much wine here in the U.S. because it's the end of our day, or you haven't had enough coffee there in our, in our, with our Seahoon colleagues across the oceans. Um, so, uh, hey, Dr. Bird, I have um, something to share. Please do. Thanks. Um, uh, so it actually ties together, I think, um, what Dr. Olival was talking about and also Dr. Goldstein. So it was a, a firsthand experience I had working in another country on a poultry project and um, getting to both reporting as well as laboratory testing. So I, we were having some uh, chickens die within our project. The laboratory in the country that I was taking my chickens to was not giving me answers for why they might be dying and we had more dying. So I called to get the appropriate permits to be able to send my sample other a lab out in another country and um, been most used to practicing in the United States, feeling very comfortable contact federal veterinarian with a problem because that's what you're taught to do. But I rapidly realized that when I contacted the national veterinarian to get my permits that I um, caught him off guard. He wasn't a I also was insulting the national lab's ability to not be able to do testing uh, and learned a lot of lessons. So it was just, um, I rec it was a good valuable thing to learn around just the hierarchy of, I think, you know, could, how could it have been reported in a different way and how could we have looked for more national laboratory resources um, ahead of time. So that was my story. Yeah. And thanks for that, Jenny. I think that's a really good point. And, and I think, um, um, ha, you know, maps don't always have the tool or necessarily the training. And I think Dr. Bird, you, you, you touched on that as well. And I think um, in particular, thinking about um, this network that we have here and building on some of the previous projects, I think a really important job is to work with with some of the national labs in particular um, to help them you know gain the tool oftentimes um, the tools are in the more sophisticated labs and not broadly available and, and I do think that's an important role that this group here um, 
can play. And then it works. I think, you know, I, 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 it's really easy for people to get, um, feel insecure or, or um, not be comfortable um, when they don't know people in the network. And, and I think that that changes when you build those relationships um, between labs and between regions so that people feel more confident, you know, knowing where samples may or may not be going to and being able to um, feel comfortable calling up and, and talking about that. And so I do think that these networks that we're working on creating are really important. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you very much for that, uh, both of you, Dr. Lane, Dr. Goldstein. Yeah, it really is these these communities of practice, us, us here right now, and sharing this ninety minutes together. Uh, we're learning about each other. Uh, I learned very interesting insights from Pissara and her uh, anthrax investigation. Our other speakers, Dean Lazario, who I I didn't know at all before uh, organizing this and and hearing him speak. Uh, you know, so this is how we build our colleague network uh, so that when things happen, we, we who to call, right? I think that's a really important thing. Uh, uh, Dean Belisario, would you like to speak a little bit to that? that perhaps you encourage your students and, and, and folks there to uh, build those networks and participate in these kind of activities to learn from each other and those connections. Again, um, beyond the contents of the classroom, where we actually uh, connect with the students by way of sharing principles, you know, the theory and examples, and moving on now to uh, the flexible mode of, of learning, we, we, we do have to really provide students enough practical experience no? in terms of being able to connect with, with individuals, other experts, other disciplines, other entities, public, private, you know, by way of networking. Uh, um, uh, to me, experience, uh, and for us you know, here in the College of Public Health, experience uh, is a major part of, 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 of teaching learning. Um, um, we'll have the chance, for instance, to do special studies, or um, um, uh, we'll have the chance to connect with existing research programs or projects. Which, by the way, in the in the College of Public Health is is now aligned um, three thematic areas, and, and the good news this community we're talking to, Dr. Bird, is that One Health is one of our top three uh, main thematic areas where students align in terms of their choice of electives, where students align in terms of their choice of researches, you know, where the whole college actually, where the whole center aligns in terms of. Of, of prioritization and, and in terms of even establishing partnership with the outside world. Now we're very, very interested to build up on our existing uh, ties you know, in the area of health. Um, again, the theory plus practice and students uh, as, they, as they end their training in public health, uh, moving on to special projects you know, aligned with specific existing programs and projects, and, and one of them would be a high priority area in One Health. Uh, this, I think, is the best uh, setup no, uh, that, that, that could be offered, one of the best setups that can be offered for our young ones. Thanks, Dean, for that perspective. Yeah, I think getting uh, the students involved early on is important in uh, One Health projects, uh, outbreak, uh, in the global activities. Uh, we have a at University of California a big effort in global uh, affairs, global projects, and making sure that our students have uh, opportunities to travel and learn from our international colleagues and and learn the systems that are in place around the world. Each country has a different system, different health systems, different ways of operating, different ways of approaching problems, and from that we all learn so much. Um, so. In our last bit here, I, I'd like to pivot to the last two questions or last two. Uh, uh, answers we had to our what, what should we do first and it, it's revolving a lot about uh, animal reservoirs and what happened in the park uh, and you know this is a, a one health activity so obviously our scenario is built around a one health principles uh, suggesting perhaps there may be an animal reservoir source of this uh, 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 disease that we're seeing in our regional hospital of course a topic 
the session's topic included the word spillover, which would be the transmission of a pathogen from an animal to a person or from an animal back to a person even. Uh, so uh, there was sort of a tie there. Just a few people said, uh, you know, investigate potential animal reservoirs in the national park uh, and also asking the Ministry of Wildlife about this cultural event. And I think let's start with that cultural event because it really talks about working with the communities and learning from what them, what has happened. Uh, would anyone like to share their experiences uh, in doing that type of work and uh, lessons you've learned and things and tips and information that you think the other uh, participants on our community of practice should hear and learn about? Anyone want to share? You can raise your hand. Okay, I may call on names I, that I recognize in the participant list. So if you, if you know me, get ready. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyone? All right. Uh, is Amanda still on from Vietnam? Would you like to share some of your uh, interactions with Tees there? I saw your name earlier. Sure, I'm coming on. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, it, you know, it was a question in the back of my mind as I uh, saw the scenario. Um, and then also in the list of options, there was contacting the, um, the protected area about uh, the cultural event. But I think the other thing that was going through my mind is um, if we think this is a, a wildlife origin or even an animal origin virus, are we ready and prepared to do the kind of sample collection you would like to do in the time that would be relevant? And I, I know, you know, like Kevin and his uh, example of following an outbreak remotely, you know, in terms of what was in the press, I think many of us were thinking, whoa, you know, what animals were tested in that market? Were they tested? Um, do they know where they came from, you know, in, in the months before? And um, so I, I think it's a challenge. Uh, I, again, I think a colleague, um, I think it was from Indonesia, mentioned the advice and the guidance would be to have those connections with the animal health sector side and the environment health sector side established before an outbreak occurs uh, and that understanding of the, the joint investigation when an outbreak of with potential animal origin occurs. And then it's the links to the laboratory side in, in terms of the confidence as well as the understanding of the kind of approaches that, that could be used, um, especially when you're working with species. Um, I think our experience in Vietnam is that the, the Department of Animal Health here is increasingly comfortable with investigations in wildlife. Um, and you know, handling wildlife samples through laboratories. Um, probably much work to be done in, in that understanding of the interface between wildlife and people, um, because that generally is not in the, uh, the broader understanding of either the public health sector or the animal health sector. And I think that's, that's when it becomes absolutely critical that you're engaging the community where you, you um, suspect that a, a spillover event has occurred, they are very much the ones who know the practices um, and whether that occurred immediately previous to this outbreak, but also the longer term uh, practices as well. And I think that's also where the academic and, and broader um, community of practice comes in in terms of continuing to do work that allows us to understand um, what some of that broader contact is and um, have again those established relations communities or trusted trusted partners of those communities that in, in many cases are not the animal health and, and public health officials that are the front line during a outbreak investigation yeah yeah i think, think and it's a challenge yeah right yeah thank you for that that was a great contribution really nice point brought up by our colleague 
uh, Alcazar. Um, sorry if I got the pronunciation wrong about in, in asking, in my experience, how do you get involved the other ministries, environment, wildlife, uh, 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 environmental protection agencies and things, how do they get involved in these and how do you draw them in? And that, that's one of the efforts, uh, certainly, uh, we engage in under the USA Predict project and, and in somewhat under the One Health Workforce project here is trying to bring all these stakeholders together to sit in, in one room and learn, not learn, but uh, get more familiar with communicating with each other, either through One Health platforms not at the national level or sub-national level, so that all these people uh, from the authority side, government side, can come together and discuss uh, the events of, of a particular scenario or outbreak or disease uh, cluster. But I think with these points, I think it would be great to, let's hear from Dr. O now. Uh, he's going to give us a, a case study in One Health investigations and uh, tell us about the exciting work they've been doing in uh, across much of Asia. Uh, looking at uh, risk of spillover of zoonotic viruses. And then with that, we'll, we're going to close out and then have some quite more questions and answers. Uh, hopefully, uh, Dean Belzario can stay on with us for that section. And then we will uh, uh, close out with our, our device. So, uh, Dr. Olival, I'll turn it over to you and, and please take it away, sir. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Bird. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, well, th th thank you for having me and thank you. Um, for all the CO Hoon folks for joining tonight or this morning for you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be part of this community. Uh, wanted to, I, th I think it's actually a perfect segue to what's how we kind of ended this with Amanda's points and uh, the sort of last two questions of the poll that we didn't really touch on. So here's a live update of my slides. Um, <laughs> so here's, here's what you, you, uh, you know, you, we prioritize and we talked a lot about, you know, the contact tracing and the ministry involvement and, and notifying the public, but a little less on the sort of animal reservoir side and thinking about uh, spillover itself. And not only how can we trace back where the spillover came from, but how is that information useful for preventing future outbreaks, right? And putting this all together within a One Health lens. Um, so that's what I want to touch on tonight. And you know, I hope to keep this to ten or minutes or so. Um, but just a schematic, you know, we think a lot about at my organization, EcoHealth Alliance, uh, as in my involvement with our the work on the USA Predict project, uh, and even now thinking about helping train, um, you know, people and uh, train One Health practitioners and thinking more about sort of modeling and analytics. Um, you know, we, we think a lot about predicting spillover and, and how can that inform sort of risk mitigation. Um, I like to think of the sort of where, where is there risk of new disease outbreaks, right? And there are tools we can use to figure out the where, these hotspot models. Um, and then what species? And that really is a really a mix of, you know, knowing how to do that surveillance in terms of the sampling of the animals, how many animals you might need to sample and test, uh, what tax it'll look at. And then looking for those viruses, as Tracy nicely highlighted, and the tools for that. Uh, and then the sort of the who, the behavioral understanding, who are those uh, high-risk uh, community members or uh, people interacting with wildlife and, and thinking about zoonotic disease emergence specifically. And then, of course, different tools for looking at epidemic and pandemic spread. And I, you know, I use this, this slide in thinking about anticipating viral spillover and spread and being able to mitigate it. But I think the same could be true with our topic tonight about outbreak investigations. And you could actually reverse the arrows on this slide. And for example, if you know, a, a disease arrived in your community from somewhere else, well, you might look at travel and trade patterns to figure out where it came from. Um, you would wanna look at those initial 15 cases in the hospital. What are those people's professions? You know, they're that culture event. What, are they, what were they doing at the culture event? Were they, slaughtering bats uh, as sort of an annual ritual that they do, you know, as part of their community uh, for a festival or something. Um, so there's lots of details, I think, in understanding the cultural nuances. And then again, getting back to what host species were responsible for that outbreak is important, not just as an academic exercise, but of course, for predicting the next outbreak and understanding if spillover is ongoing and, and infecting people uh, is an ongoing or continued risk. So all of these uh, early outbreak detection really relies and risk modeling 
on, of course, the field surveillance data. And I think that's where the, the in sort of on the ground training uh, from a One Health perspective is really important, that in-service training uh, to get people hands-on and doing this type of work. And just a few pictures from different countries across Asia that I've been involved with, uh, some human surveillance in Thailand there, uh, some of our animal sampling team in Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, and other places. So we're in the middle of the SARS-2 outbreak, and I'm in the middle of New York City, so we're very, um, very aware of uh, the importance of this. Uh, but you know, going back to SARS-1, most of these slides were put together before COVID-19 uh, was known to us. Um, and so, you know, we've been thinking about coronavirus emergence for a while. Uh, our organization has done a lot of work in China, uh, which is what I'll focus on as a case study today. And so um, we were involved in 2004 uh, in doing initial investigations into the animal origins of SARS coronavirus um, following the outbreak in China that, that spread around the world and in southern China. And um, that in those investigations, which involved a number of species and a big international team, uh, led us to a finding uh, that these rhinolophid, these horseshoe nose bats, which a beautiful picture here of one of them, uh, were actually the, the natural host of these SARS-related viruses. And of course, here we are again, and, and SARS coronavirus 2, as I'll show you, is also actually found in these same group of bats. Um, so we, uh, following SARS-1, again, before the current outbreak, as part of the USA PREDICT project and some National Institute of Health uh, work that we had a grant, um, five-year grant to look at uh, the, really the risk of the next SARS emerging. Um, and you know, we couldn't cover everything and we obviously couldn't stop every outbreak, uh, but we were trying to get an understanding of you know, where is there a high risk and where might outbreaks even be happening or bubbling over and, and uh, detection might be low and there might be a, a high risk there, but we're really not doing enough surveillance in certain regions. So we tried to cast a wide net and one of the initial objectives was to understand the diversity of bat coronaviruses um, out there in China uh, with a focus on Southern China. And the yellow dots show you where we sample bats and the red dots are where there were coronavirus positive uh, bat individuals. So we, we covered quite a bit of the country. Um, and what, what we found was that in sampling a wide taxonomic diversity, um, that really these SARS-related coronaviruses that are circled there on this table, really are the highest prevalence in certain, just a few species of rhinolophus or horseshoe nose bats uh, found in China. And that, um, you know, and we can sort of rank those host species in terms of the ones that have the highest prevalence. Uh, you can look at other patterns like seasonality of that virus shedding to better understand risk. Um, but really what, what we found was a huge diversity of about 700 new bat coronaviruses were sequenced as part of this effort. Uh, and this tree shows you where SARS-CoV-2 falls out among all these different bat coronaviruses. Um, and SARS coronavirus 1 is also shown there. Uh, and where some of the other like new findings like these pangolin sequences that have recently come out fall out. So the closest, and I think most people are aware of this, the closest related naturally occurring sequences of coronavirus are from a species of bat called Rhinolophus affinis. Um, and this was, there was another study published in Nature by some of our colleagues. And we have a study that just came out last week. Um, and, the, and the link is there. We can circulate those papers for you to look at later. Um, but why is it important to understand this diversity? Well, you know, in thinking again about future risk, but also when a new disease does emerge and you detect it in the clinic or the hospital, you're able to at least know, well, what species did that likely come from? Right? So what this network shows you is all the diverse coronaviruses, and it's color-coded by all the different bat species. Um, this is just looking at bats. But once you have a new human coronavirus emerge, like you're seeing the black dots there, SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, where you can then easily go to this map or this analysis and say, oh, here's the most closely related wildlife host that we know about. Maybe we should target our surveillance on those species and maybe look at um, you know, environments or habitats where those species and people uh, occur together to understand the risk. You know, the next important step is, is a lot of detailed lab work to say, well, 
there's hundreds of viruses, which one should we prioritize? Um, and again, I, we can send these papers around for more uh, detailed look, but you know, with, with uh, intensive lab work to sort of infect cell lines and to look at the potential for human infection, we can begin to prioritize some of those viruses for surveillance and maybe develop tools for laboratory detection to new viruses that we know exist in our countries and in our natural habitats that maybe we haven't seen in the human population yet. And here's just a picture, um, you know, of course the animal work is important, but it's not just, uh, you know, the lab work that says, well, yes, this virus might likely infect human cells. You wanna know what viruses are actually spilling over into the human population. Uh, and so as part of this effort, uh, we also sampled a large number of uh, community members, particularly people that lived in areas with, with uh, good bat habitat, high exposure to bats. Um, and a study published a couple of years ago now, again, before the current outbreak, um, we showed that actually 3% of the villagers that were sampled uh, in this area in Yunnan, China, were actually seropositive. They, were, they had antibodies to SARS-related coronaviruses. And these were not um, people that were infected during the, the SARS coronavirus one outbreak. Um, so these were new spillover events, and these were people that were being exposed to perhaps SARS-CoV-2 or some related virus, um, but obviously those infections did not cause large epidemics or outbreaks. And these are areas of relatively little surveillance. So this was a red flag, and I think this is the type of information we can get on the ground through this surveillance work uh, that really can inform um, outbreak mitigation and, and where you need to direct your surveillance activities better. And then, of course, we can use sort of ecological approaches to say, well, these are bat species that carry SARS-related viruses that are, uh, you know, potentially dangerous to the human population. Where do those species occur? And, you know, just from our sampling in China, um, looking at those species that had SARS-related viruses from China, um, they actually uh, occur across Southeast Asia, right? So, you know, this is not an isolated risk in, in one particular community. Um, these, these species interact with people across, across a wide range. And, you know, we, when we collect a blood sample from people, we also obviously do interviews to understand what are the risk factors and what are some of the behaviors and, and cultural norms and behavioral practices that might put them at risk for um, disease spillover and exposure to new pathogens. And so this is analysis uh, from our group from Hong Ying Lee is the first author uh, who, who looked in this case at sort of predictors of self-reported illness, um, but we can do the same thing with serological data and other surveillance data. And you know, what we see is these are kind of ranked. So the top one here is, well, eating raw and undercooked carnivores was, was a high risk factor. Well, that's not surprising, <laughs> but interesting to see it come out in the analysis. Um, and slaughtering poultry as a behavior, you know, as a profession was a high risk factor. Um, as well as living in close proximity to some other animals. We, um, you know, as part of the USA Predict project developed, I think community outreach was highlighted by Dr. Bird and others. You know, I think it's an important tool and it's not only necessary to go and do the actual investigations, you have to engage with the community, but of course you need to go back and report your results back to those communities. Um, and I think it's really a success story of, of some of our work. Um, I, along in the people on this call and the consortium, a lot, many people are involved with that. And we've translated this book, which is called Living Safely with Bats, um, into Mandarin and to other languages, uh, and have actually taken that back to the communities, not just say, okay, you, you know, there's evidence here of SARS related coronavirus exposure. Well, not just we know that and we're going to walk away. Well, we know that and we want to increase surveillance, but we also want to engage with the community to understand. You know, what, how are you interacting with these animals that we know carry these viruses? Uh, and how can we uh, sort of communicate some basic tools to prevent that spillover? So here's just one page from that toolkit, uh, which shows some sort of PPE standards when you're uh, around these animal populations. And with that, I just thank our, our EcoHealth funders and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Laval. That was fantastic. A great. Tremendous overview of the work you guys have done. 
uh, both the Eco Health Alliance and then across the Predict Project and Consortia. Fantastic stuff. Uh, so now we have about you know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes left for questions before we hit our uh, uh, half hour, 30 minute uh, cutoff time. So i open the floor up to questions from the participants, please. Uh, you can either share your questions in the chat box or, uh, or ask them directly if you would like. Um, any questions? <coughs> Thanks, Dr. Bird. There was one of the questions that's been coming in through the chat box and is on the Google Doc um, that relates to just expressing challenges in helping ministries to figure out how to work together proactively, because often they're in separate silos and it can be hard to find good collaboration across universities and then across ministries at the higher level. And I know for, for many of our colleagues in the Africa region, We've seen some success at the government setting up One Health platforms where there are specific ministry representatives that sit on these platforms and they set up regularly scheduled meetings um, so that they find ways to interact. And then it's much easier when an emergency comes up or a new outbreak comes up to figure out how to work together because there are action plans in place. I'm wondering whether either Sudarat from Thailand who's with us today or if others have ideas ideas and experiences to share on what's happening with regard to the idea of one health platforms um, Asia region because I would imagine that would also be quite successful and I'm sure it's happening in some places um, but might be a nice example for encouraging that to happen in others as well if it's useful. So Sudarat or others do you have any examples or, or suggestions for how to help ministries set up structures to work together? Okay, I can share the experience especially I think for Thailand because right now the government have already set up what we have one health coordinating unit that attached at a Ministry of Health but I have to tell you the truth that is a, such a long history how uh, the government uh, ministry working together in the past uh, I think it start from uh, HPAI H5 and Walker in uh, Asia region late uh, 2002 and uh, in uh, 2003. So it's quite messy when we working on uh, HPA at the beginning because of many culture, even though, you know, we can do the diagnostic, but how we going to release the information is, is very tough because um, it's a more concern from animal health sector on economic impact. So actually, it's, it's take time at least uh, nearly, I think, for two years before they can find the work uh, better together, you know. And uh, we have to respect our role and responsibility because uh, sometimes when the Ministry of Health would like to say that they can do the diagnosis, they want to report. And then it's, it create untrust, you know, and partnerships. So it, it takes time. And I think for Asia region have a, a better chance than the other region because HPAI it impact on the other country. And also, you know, it's not only from the animal health and, uh, you know, impact on uh, public health side because it's costless it's in animal. We have to bring in... Uh, wildlife sector, especially from the Department of National Park, Wildlife and Plant Conservation. They have to do a lot of surveillance in uh, wild birds, right, and migratory birds. And uh, those uh, uh, animal uh, wild, wildlife is belong to another ministry. So actually, even though, you know, animal health sector can go there and collect the specimen, but they have to get the permission from uh, Ministry of Environment. So actually these are tied in together and they have to set up the committee and also uh, during HPI, the uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister have to be like uh, the chair uh, for those uh, investigation and set up those. Th this is under EID, Emerging Infectious Disease Platform. So that, uh, you know, you need there high level the policy decision maker to convene the meeting, try to engage all ministry together. And I see a lot of a Ministry of Education participate during that time, but it's more on the uh, communication uh, to, uh, uh, to the community. So they participate at the beginning 
and you know you need a lot of ministry labor because a lot of you know were laid off during that time so these are emerging uh, you know from uh, HPAI and it, it's more than 15 years right right now and then we're working on uh, emerging pandemic threat program EPT1, EPT2 and uh, One Hill University network join in but uh, for Thailand I, I have to tell you the truth uh, uh, we see a lot of good coordination and collaboration through the uh, One Hill coordinated platform this is more like a technical issue right to provide the technical area to the policy decision maker but the university is a very is a very supporting arm because of for the diagnostic a sophisticated one and uh, you know they they have to bring in and join in especially for mature university this is a supporting arm on uh, emerging infectious disease uh, they ha have done a very good job in uh, supporting the government and become like a reference uh, laboratory for emerging infectious disease for the government and uh, so what I can tell you that is, is take time and we have to, you know, engage a ministry to working together and uh, it's take time to form trust and partnership. Just that uh, for each country, they should have their one hill coordinating unit platform or whatever. This is more like a technical uh, uh, committee to provide the feedback to the government at the policy decision making and uh, university to serve as a supporting role for the government on uh, you know surveillance the agnostic and even on risk communication because uh, yep they out of the university they are not authority for disease detection, prevention, and control. So they have to engage closely with the government. And for Thailand, what we try to advocate, because I like to see the future workforce to participate when the government do the outbreak investigation. So something that the student can learn and you know ready when they make a decision to join the uh, uh, current work. To, so this is a very good, uh, you know, interlink between the university and the ministry for their work, workforce, a future workforce or the current workforce development. So that's what I, I would like to share with yeah. you. Thank you for that, Sudarat. Yeah, maybe we could hear from Dean Belisario that just briefly on the role of the university as you see it there in the Philippines as a, as a comparison point and trying to build these interministerial linkages. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Very interesting discussion. It's easy, but uh, I think first and foremost, uh, we have to be clear on our roles, teaching, training of, of the ones, the people following us, uh, generation of evidence, the generation of data in the research, and hopefully this research results could be used for policy formulation, response and action, and lastly, public service. Now, helping our agencies, helping our ministries. No? Such, I think, is the role of academe. And it has not been uh, easy all the time to be working with ministries, uh, um, uh, especially the Ministry of Health in the Philippines. Highly challenged. We have a decentralized health setup in the Philippines where we have uh, more than 80 provinces, and, and, and thousands of local government units that actually run the health system in their own different. So you can imagine a, a whole, whole orchestra playing different, different types and, and, in, and, and on many occasions, uh, there is no in the kind of music that they play. And, and, and such is the role also of Ministry of Health, you know, which is actually the, should be the greatest conductor of them all, you know, to keep the whole biggest orchestra playing in a harmonious way. No? So, so our role really is to help the instruments to play nicely and of course to help the conductor also in a subtle way you know, without putting them down you know, because such is the role to lead. Now, and maybe we'll be beside them, we should be behind. Such is the role of the university. Um, one hand, for instance, you know, is mentioned here and there 
but I don't think it is in the top priority of our Ministry of Health at this current time. So um, when I was in Ministry of Health, I was under secretary a couple of years ago, and, and, and rabies was a, such a, a, a huge challenge as our number of dogs and rabies cases, mortalities continued to rise in spite of the fact that we, we have purchased already all the vaccines now for, for all the people with, you know, high risk dog bites, no? including, of course, the vaccines for the dogs, no? but, you know, the decentralized health system and the disconnect with the animal public health um, sector, no? and, 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 and therefore there is there's much work to do, but we should not lose hope. No? Uh, I think the challenge for academe is to keep on having that patience and understanding, you know, if it doesn't work this way, maybe another way of doing it. No? But, but really, um, it has to be a gentle type of approach, no? not, not the attack mode of, of, of doing things, as the attack mode really keeps them closed no? yeah. for a long time. No? And, and therefore, uh, it remains a challenge for us. Uh, one way forward, I think, Dr. Bird, is for academic institutions to join forces so that we have a stronger voice. Now, if, if we can join forces with other academic institutions outside the country, that is even a stronger voice. No? So that the stronger voice is heard and, and there is a little more force no? when, you, when, you, when you, have, you have a stronger but gentle voice. No? Strong but gentle you know, to try to get our authorities to act in accordance with what we wish. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Yeah, no, thank you, Dean. That, that's a great, great way to, to in the discussion, I think is, you know, it is about building relations and networks and uh, colleagues around the world and joining forces to, to as you put it, have a, have a firm but gentle voice uh, based in science, uh, based in facts, and based in uh, logical responses to challenges that will occur because the challenges are coming all the time. Uh, there's a nice uh, discussion in the chat there, but from uh, Philippe Clays from uh, FAO, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, and Kevin about building these networks uh, around the, the routine but important diseases so that then we're ready for the big catastrophes when they come. And uh, I, thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. And we're pretty much at the end of our time. So I want to thank uh, our speakers. Yeah, fantastic job. I want to thank the participants that uh, put their questions in the chat box and then ask some of them verbally uh, so we could see uh, uh, your faces and act as our community of practice. And with this, I'll turn it back to uh, uh, Dr. Smith to, help, to bring us uh, to a close and then to Dr. Vipat. So Dr. Smith, please. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, let me extend my warm thanks as well. I think there have been many nice experiences shared and words of wisdom to help keep us connected. I hope that beyond this session, we will find ways to stay connected so that we can have one strong, gentle voice um, that can help to navigate things. And so I would really encourage everyone to um, be very open and, and very collaborative going forward. I think we're really looking forward to finding ways to work together to continue to solve these challenges that are arising in many places. And the, the four C's that Dean Belisario shared with us, the collaboration, coordination, consensus, and communication, I think is a, um, a very fun way to help remember some of the important pieces. And uh, perhaps we can season our meals with that. So I will hand it back over to Vipat to share any final thoughts he would like. So again, uh, thanks for all uh, the active participation and, and the speakers who shared experiences. So uh, we are South Asia One Hill University Network. Currently, we are a group of uh, 81 university uh, in the seven uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries uh, and counting. So we are a group, uh, hopefully we have a strong voice uh, in terms of uh, advocating for the academic role uh, uh, toward the outbreak response. So uh, at the Secretariat, uh, uh, I particularly have a privilege uh, to represent uh, the academic institution uh, at the regional and global forum. So it's, it's been uh, try to advocate for what uh, we have been discussed today, uh, how the academic and can play a supporting role uh, to the government in terms of public health uh, search capacity, either through uh, the laboratory diagnostic uh, testing or you know perhaps a helping a helping hand with the government in terms of outbreak responses. As well as we also uh, talking about uh, providing uh, collecting a good data and providing a swift uh, evidence or science-based information uh, for the government uh, to provide 
and make a decision on the proper measures uh, on our quick response. Uh, last but not least, uh, we haven't uh, discussed much, but actually it's a critical role uh, of the the academic mission in terms of the uh, producing as a producer, uh, producing a competent and, and sustainable uh, health professional uh, to help prevent, uh, detect, and respond to emerging threats. So thanks again, and 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 we as a group of universities, uh, South Asia and Her University Network, uh, together with our country network, uh, 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 that that being from Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam. Cambodia, Laos, Philippines, as well as Myanmar uh, working together uh, to build the next generation of the One Health professionals uh, with uh, cross-sectoral competencies uh, and no longer uh, working in silos. So uh, look uh, to working with you and uh, we welcome uh, more uh, feedback and suggestions how we're going to uh, drive uh, this community of practice forward. Uh, because uh, this is uh, our last uh, session for the series uh, for the COVID-19 One Health Update. And we have been together for the last uh, three months. So thanks for tuning in and, and look forward uh, to engaging more uh, for months and years to come. Thank you. And, and uh, I think back to the, uh, as, uh, I don't know, the, the housekeeping and uh, the PDA and the uh, continuing medication uh, education credits i think